BMIS 270, it, uh, Chapter 4, Part 3. And at this point in time, we're talking about uh, network architectures. So an architecture is the way networks are designed to communicate. So um, initially, and something we see most often, is a client-server network. Now, obviously, this is a network where we have clients and servers. And you have your clients um, that are uh, nodes on your network. Now, this is a picture more of a home network, but consider this being a, uh, a large uh, campus network. You have your switch. You have your servers. Okay, and you have your, your nodes or your clients within your network. That could be every PC within a computer lab. So a client, okay, it's a computer or other device on the network that requests and utilizes network resources, such as printers, such as file services like your Y drive, those sorts of things. Now all uh, clients uh, run all apps. Clients need to be able to log onto the server, so they have to be able to access the server both from a from a machine perspective and from a user perspective. So, so if the client doesn't have the authentication uh, internally with Windows 7 to log on to a server 2008, it cannot do that. It has to ha it has to be given permission to do so. And then when it's given permission to to, to fire up and log on to that server then when you log on, that's a second log on with your username and password as a second kind of authentication process. And then finally, clients can access all apps and resources based on user permissions. So again, uh, students have access to some devices, whereas faculty may not have access to those same devices, uh, printers I'm thinking of. A server, on the other hand, is a computer dedicated to processing client requests. So this would be that server sitting out there on that network. Remember, you have your lab. Your lab is tied into a switch. And then that switch, in turn, is tied into a server. So a servers hold all data. Servers run all backups. And servers hold all authentication data. So they hold the main central uh, database that says um, that, uh, that knows what your username and password really is. OK, now I'm going to. Uh, go to run the slide and the next slide is a video so hopefully this is going to work for us and there we go I need to go to here There we go. This is going to talk about what a client server system is. In a client server relationship, the server controls access to shared services and data. The client sends requests to the server to access those resources. For example, the client sends a login request. The server checks the username and password to see if that request is valid. If it is, then the client can access the network. That doesn't give the client the right to use all the network's resources. For additional requests, such as viewing shared network files, the server checks to see if the client has permission for that specific action. If yes, then the request is granted. If no, the request is denied. OK, let's see if we can. Uh, Again, a very short video about uh, how a client server works. Now, here are a couple of uh, small pictures I just kind of put alongside this main video. These are both client server systems. So in this case, uh, you have basically a router. Not a router, I'm sorry, you basically have basically a switch with all of your smaller clients connected to it and your server. And in this example, it's the same sort of thing. You have your client, your clients, and your server. And so through TCP IP, you actually access the information on your server from your client. Okay, the next thing we'll take a look at, at is dis distributed processing. Now, uh, there's different kinds of processing, actually. Distributed, centralized processing, and decentralized processing. Okay, within this environment, this is considered a centralized processing environment. 
All processing occurs in a single location or facility. Think about your ATM. Whenever you go to the ATM, request cash, that request from a client is going out through the internet to those servers out at your banking system. All right, your banking uh, at your bank. Okay, those central services, and then um, that process, that transaction will go ahead and take place. Everything that happens happens on the server. So that information is processed centrally. Now with decentralized processing, what we have is each one of these machines basically handles a part of the processing. Um, so processing devices are placed at various remote locations and they may not necessarily tie together in any way shape or form. This is like using Word here, using Microsoft Excel here and Microsoft Access here. Okay, so keep that in mind. That's decentralized processing. There's no processing off of the server. Now with distributed processing, uh, the SETI program actually comes to mind. So distributed processing is um, where processing devices are placed at remote locations but are connected to each other via a network. All right, so this doesn't, decentralized doesn't have to be through a network. It often is, but it doesn't have to be. Distributed though, uh, with SETI for instance, they, uh, this is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. What they do is pull in all this uh, space noise. They're going to go out and analyze the space noise for patterns. If there are patterns, um, because obvious, I guess, as I understand it, space noise is random. Now, meaning that, and they go out and search for patterns. Meaning that if there are patterns, there might be some kind of intelligence associated with that. So, there is so much data that, that they collect though. But they send little bits and pieces out to each of us who are members of the program, who are participating in the program, and our computers um, download an app and basically in the background will process and analyze this information searching for patterns. If it finds a pattern, it reports back to the, the SETI main control and for further processing. So that's an example of distributed, uh, distributed processing. So three main kinds of processing, centralized, decentralized and distributed. Now cloud computing, we hear that term a lot. So a cloud computing environment is, is one in which software and storage are provided as an internet service and access with a web browser. Now it's extremely scalable which means it can really grow um, grow with whatever the need is. So scalable often takes advantage of virtualization. Virtualization is where you can put uh, a number of of machines on virtually or a number of operating systems virtually onto one server. I have actually a really good video that talks about virtualization and it's it's well worth the time to spend thinking about it. And then the advantages of to vis uh, well let's look at uh, uh, okay advantages to businesses. Businesses can save on system design, installation and maintenance. So when you watch this virtualization video think about can businesses save on system design installation and maintenance. The other thing is employees can access corporate systems from any internet connected computer. That's sort of the cloud computing virtualization sort of aspect. Now I think what I need to do is go out here and this video will it talks all about virtualization. I'm going to go ahead and click off the volume uh, um, externally so you won't get an echo and we should be able to play it. My name is Dan Chu. I'm Senior Director of Product at VMware. Today I'm going to talk to you about what is virtualization. To set the stage, virtualization is a trend that is sweeping enterprise IT. The overall environment has over 7 million servers being shipped worldwide every year. Now out of those, over 6 million of those servers are Intel Architecture x86 volume servers. Now these are getting deployed into enterprise data centers by the hundreds, by the thousands, even by the tens of thousands into large enterprises. Now these are traditional servers with single applications running on operating systems and they are sprawled out across these data centers. This leads to tremendous cost in a number of areas in terms of hardware, in terms of data center and facilities costs, in terms of operational management and maintenance costs. Now to address these overwhelming uh, pressures and costs, 
What enterprise IT has found as the most compelling tool is virtualization technology. Across these millions of servers, the average utilization, the average of each of these environments, these applications, is 5 to 10 percent. These servers are barely utilized across the environment. 90 to 95 percent of their capacity isn't being used on average. So what virtualization technology does is it allows you to take advantage of that as well as um, some very fine-grained technology to run these environments side by side on a much lower number of physical servers. To illustrate that, we take these environments, it could be databases, business applications, e-commerce applications, web servers, and you can take them down and consolidate them to a much smaller number of physical servers. Each of these environments now runs side by side on a single machine. And each of them is fully isolated and fully encapsulated. To show you what that means, each of these servers, what you have here, what you had in the physical environment, there's a hardware layer, there's a virtualization layer that enables all of this. And then on top of that, you have each of these environments, whether they be a database or an application server or a domain controller, they all have their separate operating systems. Could be Windows, could be Linux, could be Solaris. And on top of these, each of these applications run side by side. And each of these server environments has its own CPU, has its own memory, has its own uh, Ethernet NICs, has its own uh, disk. And so they run in isolation just as they would in a physical environment. Now, what does this mean for an IT customer? It means that you get tremendous savings. On average, the kinds of consolidation ratios that users are seeing today uh, range on the order of 10 to 1, 15 to 1, even 20 to 1, meaning that you know, a customer today is running 800 servers or was running 800 servers in a physical environment can now consolidate that down to a, a number like 60 servers. And the benefits on that in terms of hardware, in terms of data center, the ROI is tremendous. On average, customers are finding that the return on investment they're getting is in less than three to six months. And in addition, it also completely changes how customers can provision their applications, provision their server environments. So if you take how you initiate a new service or a new application before, putting this out into your data center took a number of weeks to procure the hardware, to install the OS and patch it, then to deploy the application and configure that. Now, because all this is in software, instantiating this takes a matter of minutes. Okay. Do that. And then uh, go back to our PowerPoint. And then I think that the last part of this discusses uh, really the, the internet and data transmission. And we're talking about bandwidth. I'm not going to worry about the serial versus parallel, but uh, bandwidth is the amount of data that can be transferred in a given amount of time. So uh, we'll talk more about that. So I think uh, covering these particular topics is, has probably been uh, uh, worthwhile. And um, I've had some good short videos to really supplement that. So thank you.